began studying the cave systems here in Mexico in uh, 2005, and we're very, very interested in trying to reconstruct groundwater condition through time. So we're taking cave sediments, taking sediment cores, cave sediments, and we are looking at the microfossil content within those sediments, and we're relating that to salinity and the salinity of the meteoric or the fresh water, water mass within the, within the cave system. lived in the Yucatan Peninsula since 1994 and I've been involved in the exploration of the Ocean Belt Hot Cave System since its inception in the late 90s and over the years we've seen this cave grow into this absolute monster and of course when we began to explore none of us had any notion at all that it would grow into uh, one of the largest caves in the world wet or dry. The science being conducted in, in the Oshbelha cave system is conducted by Dr. Ed Reiner. Uh, the MCP, the Mexico Cave Exploration Project, is helping out with the logistics. Uh, of course, equipment logistics, but more particularly with uh, diving logistics, such as divers joining the project from all different parts of the world. Hi, my name is uh, Arno Moll. I'm a Jury Diver from the Netherlands. This is my second year on the Oxbell Haar project. Uh, the goal of today is to retrieve as much data possible on uh, sediment. Romano. Sheila. <laughs> from uh, Italy. Uh, Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, today we are uh, doing some uh, sampling of the sediment and uh, sensor replacement. Hi, my name is uh, Arno van Eyck. I'm from uh, the Netherlands. And uh, today I'm going to do a, a survey of uh, the first bit of the main line and on one of the side passages we're going to do a water wall survey uh, here in uh, Yes Gen. Uh, all those divers are GWE trained divers and I think that the most exciting part about the project is to be able to really help out and do science from the first day in the water. The project is very efficient and very productive from day one. So during the last glacial maximum, approximately 12,000 uh, years before present, sea level was approximately 100 meters below its present level. Because the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula is uh, made up of karst or limestone that is full of uh, small holes and large holes that are forming large cave conduit, essentially a sponge. So the water level within the cave systems and within the limestone also was lower. So at um, 12,000 years before present, the water level within the cave systems was anywhere from 100 to 110, 120 um, meters below present level. So all of these cave systems would have been dry dry passages allowing humans and also animals to enter the, the cave systems or become trapped in the cave systems. As the glaciers melted, that water went into the ocean basins and then water levels came up uh, very, very rapidly up to about 6,000 years before present um, and then gradually came up to its present level as we see today.
what we're doing, the exploration, the mapping is a first step, really. And to me, the map serves as a tool for scientific study in this cave, because we can then go back and look at the map and look at the, the profile of the cave, uh, the, the, the comments that the divers have made as they've surveyed the cave, and as you do so, uh, this picture starts to emerge. And, and it's through uh, that picture that scientists like Ed Reinhardt come here and can see patterns and they can see trends within the cave that allow them to base their studies on. Came down here a couple of times and thought this would be a great place to do some research, especially uh, for the fact that they've got a stratified water column within the aquifer here uh, of some of the underwater cave systems. You see the fresh water with a mixed layer and then a the salt water. That stratification uh, permeates throughout a lot of the caves in this area. Um, those changes actually are, are, are causing larger scale uh, erosion and dissolution of the carbonate rock in the mix zone. So if you've got a freshwater lens that's saturated with calcite, uh, and being saturated means it won't dissolve any more calcite, as well as a saltwater lens that's saturated with calcite, um, when you mix those two, they become undersaturated, which means they have the power to erode and dissolve out the limestone. So in many of the caves where you've got the halocline or a picnocline, You've, that mixed layer, depending on how thick it is, sometimes from a few centimeters, sometimes up to two or three meters, uh, becomes very aggressive to the calcium carbonate rock. Uh, therefore, it, it starts to dissolve it out. So in a lot of places where you see that halocline or picnocline, that's usually the widest part of some of the passages.
So another area that we're actively exploring and mapping and trying to understand is the Sian Khan Biosphere Reserve. And Sian Khan is just an incredible marvel of nature. It's a 1.6 million acre, uh, 500,000 hectare uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And um, the cave systems that we're encountering there uh, are very different from anything we're encountering further north along the coast here. Uh, the flow patterns are different. Uh, the actual amount of water moving through these cave systems is significantly greater uh, than any of the other caves that we uh, encounter here. So it's, it's really uh, taking us into a whole new realm, both geographically but also uh, logistically. Uh, diving in these caves is very difficult. Uh, it's requiring the use of the uh, rebreather technology, the long-range scooter technology, uh, and really uh, pushing us, which is what I love about this work, is that we're continually pushing uh, to get further back into the cave, to understand it, and, and of course do it safely. The cave that we're uh, situated at this week is Oshbelha. We're at one of the entrances we call Yash Chen. This has been one of the main exploration focuses for our group over the past few years, and it provides easy access to the cave. A large tunnel going very, very far under the, the Yucatan jungle, and connecting to over 100 different entrances located within that jungle. From this site, we are able to bring many divers, uh, assign multiple tasks to them. And after a week of holding such a project, we're able to give scientists and other interest groups a wealth of data that they can take and begin to analyze and further understand what is underneath the ground. In this area where we're sitting, we are in the Mount Everest of cave diving. There are caves underneath where we're sitting now. Uh, they encompass the three longest caves in the world. In fact, where we are diving this week is the world's longest underwater cave with more than 200 kilometers of known passage. So the Hydra Lab is measuring pH, dissolved oxygen, salinity, temperature, and uh, redox potential um, in the water masses within the, uh, within the cave system. So we are taking profiles through the cave at different points and then mapping out where the meteoric or freshwater lens is and the, the brackish lens and then the, the seawater lens that is uh, below it. Uh, we are also taking um, long-term measurements of salinity and temperature and also water depth within different points of the cave. So we're using these point source sensors in the cave at different points along the passage to record salinity and temperature and water depth changes over a yearly cycle. And this will allow us to see seasonal and the effects of storms and intense uh, rainfalls on the cave hydrology. So we're coupling these long-term deployments with the Hydrolab profiles to understand the overall cave hydrology. So we're taking cave sediments and we are looking at the microfossil content within those sediments 
and we're relating that to salinity and the salinity of the meteoric or the fresh water, water mass within the, within the cave system. We're using the microfossils, and these microfossils are testate amoeba. They're single-celled organisms, and they're about the size of a grain of sand, and they produce a shell. And then that shell um, is then preserved in the sediment record, so we can take a look at uh, sediment accumulations through time. And we can look at the microfossil content within those sediments, and there are certain species um, that live in very specific environments, and in this case, very specific salinities. So by looking at these microfossils, we're able to reconstruct the salinity of the groundwater through time. And then with radiocarbon dating, we can put it into a time context. And we can use that information to then look at the condition of the freshwater lens and basically how potable or how drinkable it was through time. This is allowing us to then look at linkages with climate change and also linkages with Maya water usage uh, through time. The intention is to use that information to help better understand the decline of the classic Maya. And the decline of the classic Maya has been linked to a variety of causes, including climate change, drought, societal pressures, or conflict, and also things like deforestation due to agricultural practices. Our intent here is to try and provide some additional information to try and understand the role of groundwater and groundwater condition in that overall story. Mangroves grow right at uh, sea level and they accumulate sediment and peat, organic rich sediment that uh, we can then radiocarbon date. So when we find uh, mangrove peat below water level or below sea level, it means that the water level was at that level sometime in the past. We can collect samples, sediment samples of that peat and then we can radiocarbon date it and work out when that, at what time that water level was uh, lower. So as you can see over here, we have a nice exposure of mangrove peat. You can see the mangrove growing right here at water level, and then the sediment accumulating and building on top of the base, this uh, limestone that has been dissolved and, as we call, karstified. And the sediment uh, water level was a little lower in the past, approximately 0.5 meters here, at the point that sea level flooded the limestone, the organic matter started to accumulate and continued to accumulate as sea level rose up to its present level. So a question that I'm often asked is, is there any hope for anything? And I, I remain optimistic always, you have to be. And uh, I think, again, the real critical aspect, and I'm a big believer that these cave systems need to be shown to people. People need to know that they're there. If it's out of sight and out of mind, people are gonna continue to build garbage dumps on top of them that seep down 
contaminants into the aquifer. They're going to continue to build waste treatment plants that are inadequate for this geology and pump sewage into the aquifer. So I think there's both the health economically of this area that people need to think about and I think more importantly there's the, the health of the population that lives here that depends on the groundwater that we have here as their source of water. And so protecting it all for me is extremely important and making people aware of it is the first step to protecting